Hi, I'm Lynn Gardner. I'm the music lead for Age of Empires 4. My role encompasses the music direction, so the overall musical soundscape. I realised pretty early on that just working with one composer wasn't going to cut it because the, the outline, the plan was unique music per sieve. Uh, the music ages up, so there's four ages per sieve. So that's a lot of content and I've been working with five different composers simultaneously. Four of them all belong to one stable in Germany called Dynamedian and one uh, other composer, Mikolai. My name is Mikolai Strowinski. I write music uh, for media, but I'm mostly known for writing music for video games. So my name is Tilman Zalescu. I'm the creative director of Dynamedian and the lead composer. You know, for composing for films, it's like one line and uh, one thing happens after the other. <laughs> As opposed to telling a story like it is and helping to tell the story like it is in, in a linear media, you, uh, you create environment for the gameplay, the sonic environment for the gameplay. And composing for games, um, it's, it's much more a challenge because it's very complex. It's like almost like an architect. If I'm an architect, big games like, like Age of Empires, it's like building a skyscraper because um, every little cue and transition and intro and outro and stinger, everything has to relate to each other. Music has always been a big part of the experience in the Age of Empires franchise. Instead of the jukebox presentation um, that people might be familiar with from past titles, we introduced a fully dynamic and interactive music system that helps adapt the score to the action on screen. So obviously for a video game, we're talking about interactive music, which is essentially having the music delivered in bite-sized chunks that can be played back in different game scenarios. Building a city, exploring the world, you're going to hear the music, it's pretty calm, it's pretty chill, uh, and as soon as you engage in any kind of combat, what happens is different uh, values drive up different layers to, to play back. So if there's just a small skirmish, the music gets more tense. Then if you get in large combat, the music then flips to like a much more bombastic combat uh, soundtrack. Uh, and then to even, you know, if you get in huge combat, we have like a fourth layer again, which is the icing on the cake kind of thing. Um, so what we have are these combat values, which are driven by the number of units in a certain radius. And as soon as they're driven up or down, uh, based on the combat, the music layers will kind of interactively um, come and go. The more interactive you make it, so the, the more reactive you make the music to what the player does. You gotta learn to compose in, you know, in bricks, in sort of movable bricks. So this is what's happening in the game. You take one gameplay element and you attach a musical change to it. And then the music is affected by the external factor coming from the gameplay. You know what I mean? It's how it affects the, the overall composition. It's not a bad thing to be limited as a composer. Oh, I will only use one classical violin and compose 30 minutes of music. This is a kind of limitation, but it's great. And we've also used Dynamedian for the orchestration and the live recording production. My name is David Christiansen and I'm orchestrator. An orchestrator actually writes the score for the musicians. We recorded in Budapest and the decision was made because uh, we had very good experiences. been there to, to record the English and we for all the other civilizations as well to record orchestral stuff and some solo instruments because they have lots of good solo instrumentalists. We had the Chimalong player um, recorded for the English civilization and uh, he did a lot with his instrument. We tried to, to um, get different sounds for the different ages for him, so that uh, for age one it really sounds like a, a very not sophisticated instrument. And in age four he could, he could play it mostly like it's played today, but uh, we experimented a lot with that. Yeah. We have such a dedicated and professional uh, group of audio people here at Relic that uh, really put their heart and soul in. It was just an exceptional experience to see them dedicated and passionate about this game and, and really see the results at the end of it all. 
One of the key pillars of the Age franchise is historical accuracy, because we want to celebrate history with an unbiased voice. And to achieve that goal means doing a ton of research, working with diverse subject matter experts, and constantly making sure that we are telling stories and illuminating history in a way that will stand the test of time. Du liest ja immer das hier, ne? Ja, ja. Bereit! Marschiert, Armbrustschütze! I think it's pretty good. The voice was there the whole time. It's yeah. Make sure we get the, like, the no, projections. The vision for this project, um, as far as the voice acting and the, the kind of speech in general, was to... Um, two things. Uh, one was to give a sense of progression of language through the ages. Um, an important part of age is to show and track the progress of civilizations as they move through time. And we wanted the language to reflect a really similar ideal. An incredible amount of pre-planning and work went into researching these historical languages. And each language kind of brought up its own little uh, roadblocks and challenges. But by establishing a process, we're able to lean on their experts working alongside them to build these scripts. English changes dramatically over the timescape of this game. Um, it, it also changes dramatically over the, the last thousand years. And, and the history of English is one that is as culturally fascinating as it is linguistically. It's one thing to translate uh, English into 12th century English or 10th century English, but pronouncing it's a whole nother game. What's interesting to me is going to a place and working with people that speak the modern language regularly, how, how different or how similar the language is. Ja, daar in. Ja, daar in. Een ordentliche maas. Een ordentliche maas. Because it, it varies from region to region. It's, it's fascinating and people get to discover the roots of their own language um, if they weren't familiar already. And also they can see how similar it is in some ways. It is a unique opportunity to be working with these languages in such a way that doesn't come around that often where you get to script out the evolution of it and you get to see it. Hestes. Yes, sir. Hestes. Fundi yete. Seeth the Hestes. Aye. Hestes are common. And the real magic comes in taking those simple lines, those modern lines, and asking the historical experts that we work with to interpret that and put that in uh, historical you know, languages. Even just simple statements, aside from jokes, simple statements like move your or um, sort of move your formation to the left or formation ready. You know, you've got words such as formation, which are sort of commonplace in military jargon today that just didn't exist in the medieval period. For every language, we worked with specialized translators, people that with a lot of experience and, and kind of knowledge of of these um, modern and historical language roots. Uh, games like Age of Empires 4 are, is a wonderful way of introducing um, people, not only young people, but people in general <laughs> to the past. Um, what I hope that people get out of a game like this, as a, you know, in addition to having a great time, is an insight into how cultures change, um, how language and cultures change, but also more broadly about how medieval cultures are interrelated and entwined on a global scale. Whoa, no, no.